Let's take a look at Cisco's Firepower and the way that it implements network address translation. Uh, remember, this was developed back in the 90s as a quick Band-Aid. We said, you know, we're gonna run out of these IPv4 addresses. Uh, if you've been doing this for a bit, you may remember the IPv4 countdown timers that people would put on their websites, at least some of the geek blogs. Uh, we're like, oh no, we're gonna run out of addresses. And we did, and we're all still here. Um, so now it works pretty well. I think it works a bit better than it was intended. And I think it works so well that it's probably slowed down the adoption of IPv6. IPv6 is definitely out there, uh, but I see it in mobile networks. I see it you know, heavily used with like Asian classes. I'll do classes in Singapore, classes in China, and people are familiar with IPv6 over there. People in carrier space over here are familiar with IPv6, but I don't see a lot of enterprises that are real eager to start rolling it out. Um, within their you know, VLANs and whatnot uh, internally. Why? Because V4 is not really going away, and now it's two sets of configuration that I have to manage. It's two different ways for an attacker to potentially get out. It's two different sets of ACLs I have to be right on. So again, not saying that there's anything good or bad about it. Everybody's situation's a bit different, um, but this is one where, at least in my experience, I haven't seen a lot of customers using it internally. Uh, and I think it's, I don't want to say funny, but this thing that was supposed to just be a quick fix, network address translation, we said, you know, these addresses are going away, it's never going to work, how do we handle the conflicts when, uh, you know, there's too many devices trying to go out on this, you know, individual IP, how do we deal with devices that don't have port numbers? We found ways, and, you know, here we are in 2020, IPv6 is very mature, uh, and still, people are a bit slow to adopt it. So... The things that NAT still does for us, it preserves internal addressing plans and allows us to use the same network, like the 10 network, everywhere, and then we basically just pat when we go out. I believe it to be a security mechanism because it hides your internal network topology. No one in the world can connect to your server at 10.5.5.5. They have to first connect to that public IP address, which has to have rules which would potentially allow them in. Otherwise, there's no way to get there. So you're effectively secure by default. Uh, the minute you reach out to the internet and you start asking for things, who knows what happens there. So uh, just a quick refresher. Remember that static NAT is what we use to translate a real IP address to a mapped IP. That tends to mean we'll create a fully qualified domain name, vpn.yourdomain.com, and point to the public IP address of the ASA. When somebody gets there, you might be mat NATing it, into an internal IP address. This would be something that we may use for the MX record for our mail server. This is something that we may use for the name server for our DNS server. Might be something we use for our web server. We say when you come to www.mydomain.com, come to our public IP. Once you get there, there's gonna be a rule which will map you to the inside. So static one-to-one -one for servers, dynamic NAT, this is one-to-one, -one, but from a dynamic pool, and again, this is typically what we do for users. I did this, I'd say back in the 90s. I worked for a software developer that was making kids video games. And <clears throat> you know, at the time, Pat broke a lot of things if you tried to get too crazy. But if I'd go ahead and I'd give every single user their own unique IP, applications were more likely to work. Um, the problem is as our company grew, for every user, I had to grab at least one real IP address. And if that user had two computers, like in the 3D animation department, a lot of those guys had their own render farms. They might have you know, a dozen computers. Uh, if that was the case, if they all needed to get to the internet, if they all needed to patch, if they needed to do anything network-based, they needed all those IP addresses. So this was pretty costly. Um, at the time, it was advantageous uh, because it tended to break less things. But again, it didn't really scale that well. Uh, what we tend to use today is called dynamic PAT. or overloading, and this is also sometimes called hide. You'll see that word within portions of the ASA configuration. And it's hiding because we're taking all these real IP addresses that are attached to physical hosts, and we're translating them to a single mapped IP. This is miserable uh, for doing analysis after the fact, right? So let's say, um, somebody tells me, hey, your public IP address of your firewall attacked my web server. I go, oh man, that was any of my users. So from a logging perspective, I lose some visibility there. 
But if you're doing logging inside of the PAT device, you'll actually get that visibility back. Um, static PAT, you may know this as port forwarding. A lot of times this is what I'll do on my outside interface, my firewall, I say, hey, if somebody connects in on port 80, go to host A. If they come in on port 25, go to host B. So I might have five, 10, 20 different servers behind one single IP, and I can route individual services based on port numbers to different hosts. Cool. These are all pretty uh, well established. They've been around for a while. You probably know all that from CCNA, um, but at least we're all on the same page. When we talk about NAT direction, inside NAT versus outside, I think that's probably pretty straightforward. Uh, looking at next generation firewall, there's basically two NAT configurations. We've got network object or auto NAT, which we talked about in the ASA section, and then manual NAT. Remember, auto NAT is basically in the middle. I say NAT these devices these ways, and it tends to be what we use the majority of the time. Let me say 95%. Of course, I'm just making that statistic up. Your mileage is going to vary. Uh, but I'd say most of the time you use that. And then what we do is we come up before this with either very specific statements, like when you see this server talking to that server on this day of the week, do it this way. That's specific. Um, and then I can do manual after auto. And this is where I do really generic. I say, hey, firewall, when you see traffic from any interface go into the outside interface, pad it to the outside IP. It's just kind of a catch-all that makes everything work. Now, when packets come in, we evaluate these rules top down. So we want to make sure our most specific rules are up top, our most broad generic rules are at the bottom, and the behavior here is not a whole lot different from an access control list. Once again, should you go to the trouble of defining objects, we can leverage those within our NAT configuration, which makes it easy to do, it makes our configurations consistent, um, looks good, is easy to read, it makes everything more intuitive. So what we're looking at here within the next generation firewall are our NAT rules. Uh, what I'd like to just draw your attention to are the different areas. And again, if you understand this on the ASA, it's the exact same thing. We've got sections one, two, and three, Here's my specific entries. Here's my auto NAT. Here's my generic statements at the bottom. Again, as I mentioned before, the NAT table is going to be processed from top down until a match is found. Section one, we apply in a first matches rule. So we pack it comes in. If we've got a match, we look no further. If we don't have a match, we keep working through our rules. We first start with static, then move to dynamic. Um, again, as soon as we find a, uh, a path, we take it. If we don't find a translation, the packet is forwarded without it. See, in the old days, this wasn't the case. It would actually require you to do a translation, and if you didn't, the packet would be thrown away. So that requirement for NAT was once required, then it was optional, and now it's kind of deprecated. You don't have to NAT things. Uh, the idea was that, oh my gosh, we're leaking internal IP addressing information. And from like a, a best practices perspective, that's probably a pretty valid concern. Um, but in our case, what we see is a lot of folks using the next generation firewall. <clears throat> and what they're doing is they're moving it closer to the inside of their network. They're not just keeping it at the edge. So we go, oh, well, if you're looking at traffic and doing inspection between the developers and between the art department, and between what's going on in accounting, I think forcing that between accounting and art department is probably more complexity than we want. Remember, when we start natting things, if you're trying to put together crimes or compromises later and you're looking at source IPs, but they're natted, and now you're trying to find old logs, it just makes your job a lot harder. So as firewalls move from just being perimeter devices to things that we started to bring closer to the core, not necessarily in the core, maybe, um, but typically, you know, just, just other portions of our network, we start deploying these things, we go, you know what, NAT isn't always the answer, uh, especially between internal departments. So if you see that change, if you wonder why it happened, that's all they were really doing there. Here we show a practical example or use case where they want to achieve a lot of different things uh, on the Firepower appliance. First off, we want to translate the DMZ server SSH service on port 22 to the public IP of port 2222. 
So the idea there is that the server is actually listening on 22 like normal. I'm not going to map it to 22 in the public internet just because there's malware that sweeps. Maybe they've got a new uh, zero day for SSH. And they're not going to hit me because I was super clever and I moved mine over here to port 22222. Well, if they scanned all ports, they'd find that. Most automated worms and things aren't going to go to that much trouble. Uh, but OK, that's what I wanted to do. What else is going on? I want to translate my DMZ server using static NAT to a public IP. Fair enough. I want to translate hosts on the inside network. When they communicate with hosts on the partner network, at the same time, I want to translate hosts onto the partner network. A lot of times, this is what we call uh, twice NAT. We'll use this in situations where our network, 10.10.2.0, is using the same address space as the partner network. Has anybody had to deal with this before? <laughs> Maybe multiple times? Not a great time. Not a great time. Um, I'll use weird numbers. If I'm going in and building the first network for a new company, I'm like 10, 253, 174.0, just because later down the road, perhaps it won't collide or overlap with somebody else. Uh, all you guys out there doing 10, 1, 1, 0, 0, <laughs> I hope we don't meet, because <laughs> there's, there's always those overlaps. Uh, again, you could re-IP, which is going to be a cleaner solution. It's going to be easier to understand, uh, but that's not always the answer. And if, we, if it's not the answer, if we can't change IPs, the idea is to do twice NAT. And we're like, OK, we're going to change 10.10.2 to 10.10.3, if that wasn't in use down here. But, and then on the other side, we go, we're going to change 10.10.2 to 10.10.4. So instead of using two different subnets, you end up burning three. But sometimes that's just uh, what's required. We'll configure NAT exemption. Remember this one? We go, hey, firewall, don't NAT these packets. And it's like, which packets wouldn't you want us to NAT? And I say, the ones going through the site-to-site -site VPN. My rule set says, when you see people coming from 10.10.2, going to 192.168.10, encrypt it. If I start NATing that traffic, it won't match my encryption policy. We can translate hosts on the inside network using dynamic PAT to the public outside uh, address. Very, very common thing to do, right? So looking at the configuration of this, once it's in Firepower, I think this is very intuitive, very easy to read. Again, this is just our NAT table, sections 1, 2, and 3. Uh, again, from top to bottom, we see the direction. can be bidirectional, can be inbound, it can be outbound. Uh, we see our source interface, destination interface. Here's the original packet, almost like if. If a packet comes in looking like this, and your firewall says, yeah, and I go, I want it to leave looking like that. Pretty cool, right? 